All right, so we are the Adventium Caspian um, Capstone Project. I'm Jordan Herman. I'm Samantha Ingersoll. I'm Tyler Chosas. Uh, and I'm Ben Mohan. So the overview of our uh, project is we're first going to go through our intro, we're going to go through our problem solution, project use, break down the sprints, give you a project and a status report, do a demo, post-mortem, and go into our questions. So for our capstone project, we are sponsored by Adventium Labs, and our mentor, Tyler Smith, is right over there. And um, Adventium Labs is a contract-based software developer that has developed multiple technical solutions for a variety of topics, including cybersecurity, systems engineering and automated reasoning and then in our situation we're doing more of a military based GPS simulator that uses federation data um, our primary con well yep yeah, I already covered that uh, the next slide project stakeholders and ours were ourselves the team our mentor Tyler Smith and then we also had the project uh, itself, which is the Caspian project. It stands for Common AADL Simulation Planning and Integration Architecture and Node System. Um, so the problem, why do we need Caspian? Caspian serves as a solution to a current issue within military training exercises right now, costing a lot of resources, a lot of downtime to set up. They're uh, large-scale war games for troops and um, scenarios that they might be facing in a real-time event. Uh, one of these, like a typical scenario could be for you're running a large scale operation with let's say 100, 200 troops in the field. You have to mobilize tanks, aircraft, and uh, UAVs and a lot of other um, pieces that will cost you like a decent amount of money to the military just to mobilize all these aircraft and vehicles. Where And they also limit you to where you can perform these simulations. So if you want to do something like let's say downtown Chicago, or in more of an urban environment, you're more limited as they probably don't want you flying an Apache helicopter over civilian residents, um, especially at low altitude. So what this does for us is allows us to open up more of an area for what these war games can, where these war games can happen and what they can cover. So you can reduce the uh, cost by getting rid of all these large scale uh, equipment and vehicles being utilized and implement it more in a simulation environment or a uh, stationary node control, which is what ours works with is kind of a combination of the two. It takes federation data and outputs it to a GPS um, uh, simulator that then kicks out, or kicks out some visuals for you using physical and simulated data. Um, so the need short term, what they needed from us was a visual, uh, visual display for customers. We had a kind of short time time frame for the main view of the project. Uh, it was right around midterm. Um, and then display for the Federation test data. Uh, the long term is we need to design something that could then be used later to give you more in-depth interface and upgrade to a large scale module, um, as well as use user-friendly display and controls. And then it kicks off to okay, so, uh we are using Caspian, which it uses a simulation to provide real-time data, so kind of like a mini-map on a video game like Battlefield 4, where it shows helicopters and ground troops and stuff. Um, it provides a flexible, scalable, cost-effective solution for combat training, so it helps uh, get things done. And what we were supposed to do with the project was take the uh, data we were getting and put it onto a map. So the GPS and simulation data came from one part of the project and we were building the part of the project that was displaying what was being seen. Um, so the project use, uh, it was to uh, visualize the advanced federation data, so show what was going on um, and from that data users would be able to react and move so if there's a helicopter flying you'd maybe want to avoid it or get out of the way of it. Um, serves as a future basis or a training map so you'd be able to pull off maneuvers that you needed to do 
and it was allow us for Adventium to show that demo to future customers. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a breakdown of um, our schedule for this entire progress. Um, so we had four different sprints. Um, the first three sprints were about two weeks long each. Uh, the fourth sprint was longer because uh, the project was virtually complete after sprint three. All that was really left after that was project cleanup and some of our stretch goals. So going into sprint one. During the majority of the sprints, uh, we focused on setting up our workspace environment on our own personal computers. Um, this took a considerable amount of time. Um, we had some issues we were kept running into, but our mentor from Eventim, Tyler Smith, was able to help us solve most of the problems that we had encountered. Um, next, we had focused on displaying um, dummy information on the open map, just get kind of get a feel of how the system works. And we also ended up um, creating and running a simple federate, just again to get a feel of how all these um, systems are going to play out. Um, during our second sprint, um, our main task was to connect OpenMap to the Federation. So after completing uh, that, we worked on viewing a simulated unit on the map. Uh, we ran into a couple of difficulties when it came to updating the map in real time. The, so that task ended up being moved into Sprint 3 after that. And so for Sprint 3, we had uh, carried over that task from Sprint 2, and that ended up becoming our main task in Sprint 3. Uh, so really getting the map to display a real-time GPS location on the map uh, proved to be a very difficult challenge. Um, the problem was that um, even though the simulated point was being shown on the map uh, and the Federation was sending information with the updated coordinates, the map was not refreshing with these given points. Um, so that ended up becoming our largest task by far in this um, project. Uh, it ended up being like 30 story points. Um, so it was a huge task that we really had to work on during Sprint 3. Um, there's a few other small functions that we did during Sprint 3 as well, like uh, the capabilities to zoom and move around the map. Uh, these functions were pre-built, but we really just needed to focus and ensure that they were working properly during the sprint. And that brings us to Sprint 4, our final sprint. Um, during the, after Sprint 3, we were pretty much done with the project. Really what remained was uh, to be completed was additional polish and code cleanup. So this included a plethora of plethora of small tasks like uh, better commenting, um, removing unused code like test code or commented out code, and organizing resources in a separate package. During Sprint 4, we also encountered a handful of bugs in the project. So we took some time um, fixing those bugs. It, it, it did take significant time, but we got those all done. Um, and then also during the sprint, we had an option of choosing a stretch goal to complete. Um, since we had a few weeks extra um, during the sprint because it was really pretty much up to us what we wanted to do. We had chose to do um, display path history. So um, it's just at each unit now, uh, we want to decide the unit would display where they have been. And we had gotten that done during our, as a stretch goal in sprint four. Come back. Sorry, quick. Mm -hmm. So um, in sprint three with the uh, real time updating, the main issue with that was open map doesn't really provide a whole lot of uh, documentation and it's very um, kind of janky where it is because it's an open source project or product and uh, we actually spent a lot of time communicating back and forth with Tyler Smith to get that up and running we I don't even know how many classes and methods we made trying to figure that one out before that one eventually got solved but that's why it ended up being such a huge ordeal is the fact that there wasn't a lot of information out there on it it's hard to find uh, valid data that we could try and apply or rewrite for our um, project in regards to something that was relatable as it's very um, kind of it's the documentation is very uh, vague when it comes to that uh, open source toolkit yeah and so basically sum it up uh, all the progress that we have made in the past few months um, we had successfully connected the map to the Federation, um, can view units on the map, uh, we can update the moment, movement of the units, um, each uh, unit outputs its information. Um, there's zooming and panning on the map, and we can now view flight history, and uh, again, a view in, uh, like unit information like its altitude. Goals that we did not get to, um, we didn't quite get to flight path, path prediction, so that's something that future teams or um, this project can go towards. Is, uh, 
predicting some flight, flight path prediction, and also we can make a more aesthetically pleasing map. Uh, as you'll see in our demo, it's very simple, and it could definitely use some um, updating when it comes to that. So just a couple of project cha challenges that we um, had encountered. Um, communication is one of our biggest things that we um, had encountered along the way. Uh, we have communication against sponsor was, uh, our sponsor was, um, at times we had uh, just lost a little bit of sense of communication within our team as well. Um, we ended up not having a real clear leader in our team for a little bit of the time. And so after we cleared up all, all that communication issues and we actually set someone as our lead, uh, things become a lot more smooth. Uh, another issue we had run into is our accelerated time. Unlike we stayed, most of our project was done during midterm. And so um, our project had kept accelerating, it changed dates a couple of times, and so that was definitely um, some, uh, something we had to work through as, our, as that. Um, our initial project setup took a great more deal time than we had initially planned, but our uh, Tyler Smith from Eventium had really helped us out in getting through that and any questions we really had, um, he was able to help us out with. And then again, the real-time updating of the map was a huge thing that we had to work through. Um, it ended up being a lot more work than we had initially, initially intended it to be or had hoped it would be, and it, we had got it done. It just it was a lot of work. Um, uh, some risks that might inc uh, encounter in the future is uh, we're not really sure if the Federation data could change, um, and that could alter uh, because the altered source um, information would require would require refactor. Um, that's just a possible risk that people could encounter in the future. All right, now um, Ben is going to take over and with a demonstration piece of our project. Um, yeah, so my name is Ben. Um, currently, our portion of the project was focused on uh, just ba the basic display of all of the Federation data. So um, there's not a whole lot of interactivity with the map now. You can move and pan and view the data. But beyond that, um, that is the bulk of the uh, interactivity right now. So I will show you it in action. Uh, so yeah, the display serves as a visual representation of the Federation. Um, and because uh, the bulk of the data is generated, well, all of the data is generated from uh, outside of the, the map itself, the Federation, um, you have to start uh, the other Federates first. Um, so that's what I'm doing right here. Uh, and once uh, all of the external Federates are running, uh, it'll start sending data out uh, through the, the, uh, the runtime interface. And uh, the map ends up receiving the data from uh, all of the federates that are running. Uh, and that includes longitude, latitude, altitude, and uh, the team, along with an ID. Um, and you can see here the, uh, the units are represented as helicopters right now. And uh, they are stored uh, as unit objects. Uh, that have all the same data that the Federate passed to them along with some other additional stuff. Um, we also store uh, previous positions to allow uh, for the history dots. And uh, one of the stretch goals we want to do, uh, do as well was having uh, an easy way to just display additional variables. And uh, you can see, well, not really, but uh, you can see uh, just adding a label and a variable is uh, pretty simple. Um, and that was one of our stretch goals that we wanted to do. Um, the, the big challenge that we had mentioned earlier of getting the map to update in real time, uh, it currently runs on a timer and then uh, on, a, on a different thread and it'll just continue to refresh the map, which allows the units to move. So yeah, uh, that was... Oh, and you can see as well that the... Uh, the latitude and longitude, or the latitude, well, it's hard to see, but the latitude does update as the uh, units move. So that was our that was our stretch goal. Um, so we had a post mortem discussion at the end of our project, and we did an overview of our project and our code, and we there was some interesting data. Um, we had a uh, 1, 000, uh, 1,100 lines of code, roughly. Um, and that was that was cut down pretty heavily from what we had before. Um, we cut out a lot of unnecessary code and test code and such. Um, we had 12 classes. Uh, we had originally only designed four, 
Um, so there was eight more classes than we had planned, and that that go, the, we realized that we did probably didn't do as solid a job as planning as we really should have and could have. Um, there's also 103 story points, and that was nine more than we had planned. Um, and that, that was tied into getting the map to update in real time. That was a lot more work than we had anticipated. Um, and finally, uh, there, was th well, there was three packages, um, not that big a deal, but then uh, there was two months that we spent, uh, and another interesting tidbit that we noticed at the end, there was two months that we spent where the location data, both of the values for the units were getting assigned uh, latitude and not latitude and longitude, so it was just moving slowly through Turkey, which was not what it was supposed to be doing, and we noticed that at the very end, instead of, you know, at the beginning, but um, it, it now moves correctly on the map. But uh, some of the reflection stuff that we have is, uh, it's really important to have active communication between group members. Um, getting a response from, like, responding to our messages was hard at the beginning. We were not great about it and that just slowed down everything. Um, planning in the beginning will make everything easier. Um, we really should have focused more time on creating good documentation and uh, a thorough schedule. Uh, we kind of flew by the seat of our pants a little bit for a while, and that definitely impacted how we were able to progress. Um, and without leadership, we we didn't really get a whole lot done. And, uh, and it wasn't like having like a a dictator of a leader, but just having someone to order, organize and coordinate stuff um, was really important. And then, uh, yeah, software development is hard. So, like doing the, those things that we could have done, um, they would have made the whole thing easier and the progress faster. So, some of our next steps, um, we would have liked to implement path prediction, and we had a couple ideas about how to do that, like taking the slope and just adding like a cone out in front. Um, update more visuals and UI, uh, get some more maps and stuff and maybe like have terrain on there. We just had the continental world map and that was okay to work with, but adding more would uh, mean working with some like mapping software which none of us really had or had experience with. Um, add for more unit classes, so we would like to add like maybe tanks or airplanes or units for ground troops um, and then improve separation decrease coupling so split some of our code sections up a little bit more into better classes and stuff um, and improve documentation like open map had some pretty bad documentation so if somebody needed to edit our code that we'd have better documentation for them and any questions At this point, there's no um, differentiation between the two. So, like any unit right now would be displayed as helicopter at this current point. Um, that could be simply done with a, a variable addition. The units are a constructor class, so it would just be adding another variable in there to determine which class it gets built or unit gets built as. So the information is there. Yeah, all the um, necessary output information that it would need to display itself is there. It just needs a new um, identifying key to change it, which it gets displayed as the map. That was kind of one of the things we were going through when we were designing a lot of our displays, making it very robust so it can be added on and um, change in the future to where it's not going to go and just basically blow up the whole project, make you start from scratch to where it's very um, buildable and a continuable project for sure. How, how hard would it be to replace the map? Um, the map, depending on what we wanted to, like if we wanted to act, just throwing a new image on there would be pretty straightforward. But if you wanted to throw something in there that, um, let's say you have a helicopter going through and you want to be able to change altitude if it's flying over a mountain or over a canyon or something like that to where its altitude would obviously change. Even if it's flying, just maintain its current height. Once it flew over one of those positions, its altitude would obviously change the map. And that's something that None of us really had, that's one of the main reasons um, for one of the things we'd like to do, but something we can't really accurately display. I mean, we could obviously just throw a new visual in there and make it look prettier, but
but it wouldn't have the functionality that you would want from it. Uh, where if you're on, you know, on the field and you see that you have a mountain ridge to your right and then something's maintaining an altitude of 150, you're going to be expecting it to be coming around at a different height over that mountain, but rather it could be coming out at what is considered sea level and be 150 feet above sea level, which might only be 20 feet for that mountain. Well, so. um, really, uh, so as far as changing the map visuals, the thing was just finding uh, map, like better map visuals. It, it was taking more time than I thought when we kind of thought was valuable. Um, there was more polish that we could do rather than changing the map. Um, and as far as like adjusting for altitude and stuff, that was kind of out of the scope of our project. Um, the data is supposed to be funneled in, and um, there's certainly in the future could be like reactive based on like map information. But uh, as for our part of the project. We didn't alter data as soon as it arrived. So, any other questions? I guess uh, was this something even the the current implementation that it's going to be pushed out and used soon, or is it kind of still early and more of the features that you kind of indicated, like flight path, were going to be integrated in before this was kind of used in terms of training missions or? Um, as far as our understanding of the project go, uh, it, it's it's kind of like a continuing development process. Um, so this is not like the end product. Uh, it's very much like a first iteration. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. It probably isn't going to be pushed out to like troops as is or something. Yeah, won't be out there next week. 